I heard uh, just this morning from Myung Mi Kim that uh, she had some kind of a medical emergency. I don't know any more details. My thoughts are with her. I, I know she's had some issues in the last year. Um, uh, but the last time I talked to her, and even today, she sounded okay. So just hoping for the best. I did think about reading a poem by her, but then I found the same poem um, online. And so I want to play it, but I'm playing it in part because I also thought it, well, it helped me think about Orlando's work and how to introduce him. So I'm going to play this one poem by Myung, and it is uh, a few minutes long, and I have to share screen to do that, and then I'll, I'll go on and introduce Orlando. And I'm going to start with the uh, very short piece that precedes the, uh, the quote unquote numbered sections. You all can hear that? Okay. It's called Exordium. In what way names were applied to things? Not every word that has been applied still exists. Through proliferation and differentiation, airborne, here, this speck and this speck you have missed. Nominative, numbers in cell division, spheres of death, the paradigm stitchery of unrelated points. What escapes like so much cotton batting, the building rather, in flames? Does flight happen in an order? Dates to impugn and divulge. The laws were written on 12 tablets of bronze which were fastened to the rostra, trembling, hold, manner of variation and shift. Vacillation hung by tactile and auditory cues. Common use. Those which are of foreign origin, those which are of forgotten sources, place and body, time and action. The snow falls, a falling snow, a fallen snow, a red balloon and a black winged bird, a semblance of crossing in a pittance of sky. Chroniclers enter texts and trade. Was to children dying before their mothers, accounts and recounting a nation's defense, names of things made by human hands, making famine where abundance lies. Alterations through the loss or transposition of even a single syllable. The next day is astronomical distance and a gnarled hand pulling up wild onions. Placed on a large flat rock and covered by a series of smaller stones, edicts of building for private persons, remaining principalities long ago divided off. Under that place, which is called the earth wall, around which extends a savage trackless waste infested with wild beasts. Near city walls, shapes of battle helmets, instruments for giving precision to ideas of size, distance, direction, and location. Lay bare and make appear. The gates are wicked, fresh, with shields, suns for war and fields. This hill was previously called. It is recorded that on this hill, when the rickshaw stopped, it was three o'clock. The heavy chains were taken off and they walked to the place of execution. One boy's shoe fell off and he reached down to put it back on, taking a long time to do it. Fierce dogs have come over to see. K 
incantation, cut worms in tomato beds. Roots of a tree close to the property line have gone out under the neighbor's cornfield. Wherever kin of word is, partnership of words is one of many members. Glyphs to alphabets, calendars disarray. They had to eat as much as they could in a hurry. Venom verifies to aid and popularize waste. Minuscule pebbles embedded in domestic crops. With the soot covered rice pot, stood and sat, stood and sat several times. A second class of words in which comparisons are made. The pond after rain, a lily, watershed and water level. Speaking and placing the speaking. To speak from the place of the word is to speak forth. Such noise in the fields and bathhouse, the farms and mills. Standing in proximity, the two verbs think and love. See, meet, face. Incidents of generation even mass, walls of wattle, straw and mud, a laundering stone and stones for the floor, gently, gently level the ground. This is the leveling of the ground. Okay, so that is the first poem in Rungmi Kim's book, Commons. Although if you have that book, you notice certain differences. That was a recording from a reading made before that book was even published. So there were some changes. But some of the things in there, particularly about the transposition of even a single syllable or the classes of words in which comparisons are made or to speak from the place of the word, make me think of Orlando White's ability to find poetry in any juxtaposition of two letters, two sounds, two syllables, of find the possibility of poetry virtually anywhere. And as Myung Mi Kim says, standing in proximity, think and love, so that his speaking forth like hers comes out of a kind of love, I think a love of all. I, I'm reminded in some ways in that sense of finding poetry anywhere of uh, the beginning of Ed Dorn's book, Hello, La Jolla, which, which begins with A is for ism, which says it is the poet's occupation to compose poetry. The writing of it is everywhere. And I believe that, and I also um, think that this is in evidence tonight. This is in evidence, I hope, in many of the POG readings. I have somehow closed my more standard bio of Orlando, so I'll just close with saying that Orlando is Diné. Uh, who lives in Sile, Arizona, teaches at Diné College, and also teaches at the uh, program of, of the American Inst the Institute of American Indian Arts in Santa Fe. He has two books, one of them which uh, uh, letters won the San Francisco Poetry Center uh, Poetry Center Book Award, and he is. In my mind, and I, this goes back to what I was saying about him in relation to Myung, um, without even attempting to be perhaps profound about everything, because of his poetry, comes out of this finding of poetry in the world and in relations of everything, he becomes one of the most profound poets I know and one of the most moving. And I am very happy to introduce him on this occasion. Please welcome Orlando White.
Yeah, um, thank you, Charles, Alexander. I really appreciate you inviting me tonight. Hoping to read with Myung Mi Kim, who I admire her words, her, her work, her mind, her poetics. And also thank you to Stephen as well and to Pog and to um, everyone who is here tonight and those like poets and writers who help fund this wonderful reading series. I believe I read in Tucson many years ago for, for Pog and it was a beautiful space that evening and I had a really wonderful time and so thank you all for, for attending tonight. Oh, just to make things clear, um, I don't teach at the Institute of American Indian Arts. That was um, many, many years ago, it seems like. So, um, but thank you for that introduction, Charles. And um, Myung Mi Kim will be here, uh, you know, in, in, in language with us tonight. And um, before I get started, I just want to introduce myself. Yate she Orlando White Dashijine, Nanesh Ejet Rabahan Nishle, Aro Nakai de Nebashish Chin, Tachi ni Dashiche, Aro Kiaani Dashinale, Tota Kanda e Denasha, e Ekutal de Nenishle. So I'm going to start with reading um, an excerpt from one of Myung Mi Kim's books, just to honor her presence, even though she's not here with us this tonight. Um, I do feel the words that were played earlier in the audio, and I'd like to speak some of her words tonight as well. So I'm going to read excerpts from a book um, titled Dura, um, which is published by Night Boat Books. There is a, a poem in the back titled Hummingbird, and I'm going to read some excerpts from, from, from this book. So this is by Myung Mi Kim from the book Dura, the poem titled Hummingbird. Name. Translate. One. Praise beasts and their worthy marks. Two. Wear a red scarf while grinding grains. Three. Weave fine hemp cloth and thick hemp cloth. Four, on the eighth day of the third month, count your barrels. Five, on the 10th day of the fourth month, ward off cap cuts. Six, talk is hard, to bear and difficult to be rid of. Seven, in a shady spot place a well. Eight, keep cranes in the front garden. Nine, high places are used as dry fields. 10, low places are used as rice fields. 11, the fifth day of the ninth month is good for birthing cows. 12, copying began on the sixth day of the 12th month. 
scat rule of identity in works. Great learning, modulation, raising, slackening of the voice, break in light, very faculty and expression, sod. The first deleted me written over as a tablet would exact. The foregoing citation. As regards the change of a syllable and consequently of the whole word. In this place, which we translated curving and bridling, we can say also curving and frisking. Who wrote the word on the page that is the word on the page? So there's just some excerpts from Dura by Myung Mi Kim. So I'm gonna um, share some work here and I'm gonna share my screen. So um, <clears throat> I just wanna make sure that um, I get this right. <laughs> um, let's see here. Um, first of all, can everyone see that okay? Yeah. All right. So I'm going to start with a Diné concrete poem, a visual poem in my tribal language, which is Diné. And this one is titled Zero Rolling or Rolling Zero. So we have the word Nazbas, which in Diné generally translates to zero or circle. Then we have a verb, which really is a phrase. Um, nanamas, which I translate here generally as rolling. Nas bus, nana mas. Nas bus, nana mas. Nas bus, nana mas. Nas bus. Nana mas. The zero is not a circle, it's an empty clock, 
and the clock is an O which rolls to the other side of the page. But the C stuck between the B and D beats itself and the page will taste how desperate language is. If you peel a sheet of paper, you will find letters who have eaten themselves. The A who chewed itself until it became a dot on paper and the Z who ingested, ingested itself until it was a tiny line on a page. Within the white spaces, they have become inklings, miniature dark skulls and black specks on paper. But they still move like the tiniest gears in a clock. And their bones are scattered like dry grains of ink on a white sheet. I think of their deaths, the stiff face, the stiff face of a choked letter, the broken jaw of an E, the throat of an F slit open, an I swallowed up to its torso, the dot bitten from a J, the letters of a sentence removed with teeth, a sentence dipped in bleach until it becomes a skeleton, the bones thinning into calcium, the sockets of the skull discoloring into pale ink, and you will hurt it more if you try to slip its bones back through the flesh of ink or dress it back into its dry black clothes. Trace a circle on top of another. Both are alike but do not mean the same thing. Divide zero by zero. Both are not something on either side of its given place. Listen to the clock without numbers, the sound of something not written on. Write the letter O, see the straight line curve one end into the other. Use the color to fill in the black dot at the end of a thought. Without empty form, there would be no given fixed point, the center of zero. The letter L bends white on paper, but the letter O bends itself, but the letter O lends itself to be bent by space. The outline of a zero should roll off the paper after it is written. the center of black, blank shaped like a circle. Do not think outside of this. I listen to the dark zero in my skull. It sounds like ink filling a white dot on a black sheet of paper. Sometimes it is a punctuation mark with little dark wings. It does not fly, 
blinks like an eyelash. I always wait for the first letter to appear on the page. And when it does, it shakes its fist up at me. At times, language wants to be dressed in a suit, white necktie, but I prefer a pause between ink and letter when words are silent, unclothed. The clock on the wall swallows a fly, and I see tiny legs struggle between the teeth of a number. Somewhere inside the dark, a shadow tries to lighten the dot on the letter I. He rubs it against paper, it smears instead. This is what I like about language. The way one feels sentences. The way one folds sentences and feels the bones of words, letters crack, then unfolds them. Tiny black pieces that reconnect again on the page. I do not like to go past the period because language resists death. Because underneath bones, subject and verb wait to be revealed. The way one can erase milk to find calcium. The way an erased letter on the page dries into white. The top of the letter I is not a tiny round mark made by as if made by or as if by a pointed instrument. It can be a round letter, a blank zero, or an unwritten circle. Imagination is an equation. X and Y can be added, subtracted, multiplied, and divided. You were an unnatural birth, she said. I was a letter in the center of an O, born and pulled out, head shaped like a punctuation mark at the sentence's end. He gave me a book and I opened it. The first line I noticed was the child with the blank face of an egg. Then I felt my face erased to its skull. There was a missing space. So I peeled off a piece of a letter from the next page and I nudged it carefully between the I and J. She said, how does it feel to have your head stuck in a zero? Silence in a moment is imagination. And I replied, it is my halo. I erased the zero and it appeared in someone else's thoughts. The sum of a zero and zero is zero. I wrote it again. This time it made sense. He said, we raise it to the lips of the nearest ear. So I began to open books, listen for ink boiling, the scent of words, coffee brewing in my ear. I watch the clock as if reading a sentence. The numbers were letters, the shorthand was a subject, the long hand, a predicate, and the seconds, verb. We both stared at the ceiling. I said, my eyes feel as if they're inside cups. Then she said, shall I pour your ears? Shall I pour your eyes back into your ears?
Language structures what we see without saying it. But I begin to pull bones from sentences and rearrange letters into skeletons. I heard a circle as if it were a clock. It did not tick, made the sound of an insect. It was a number in the shape of a cricket. I opened an envelope addressed to me. I pulled out a blank sheet of paper, unfolded it. In the letter, no message, no sender's name, just white space. I like that you exist, she said. Like the lowercase I, my body felt present on a page, fitted in a dark suit, white necktie, and inside the black dot, a smile. But it was the way her skin felt as she dressed into a black outfit the way her body slipped into a long, dark dress shaped like a shadow. He picked up a stone, held it to his ear, shook it like a broken watch. He opened it and inside were small gears shaped like a clock. I am a skeleton, a sentence too, although like you, I am neither a meaning nor a structure, just silence and a complete thought. So I'm gonna switch back to my, um, my screen here. Um, so this next uh, visual poem is also in Diné. Uh, it's, it's also a, a concrete poem, a visual poem. Um, So here, the word naltos translates to paper, and the word diyoke translates to rug. And then I have the phrase chihwente. Naltos. Paper. The yoga. Rug. Che. Hunte. So the word or the phrase, if you will, is referred to Diné rugs or Navajo rugs. If you look at a traditional Navajo rug, for example, Normally, you would see, especially in the older Navajo rugs, you in, in the upper right-hand corner, you would see 
a piece of yarn that is a different color from the rest of the rug. And it basically appears as a almost sort of a um a mistake by the rug weaver. But this line that appears in the rug creates an imperfection. And within that imperfection, it's a deliberate one. And the Dene weaver refers to it as, would refer to it as Chewente, which is also known as the spirit line. But in this case, I translate it as the exit way. And so the idea of it is that the energy of the Dene weaver goes into the rug and that energy within the rug is able to exit from through 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 chihunte, through the exit way. The energy of the rug weaver goes into the rug, and then that energy of the weaver through the rug transfers to obviously the we to the viewer. But also I think the weaver also uses the exit way or chihunte as a way in which the weaver, the artist herself, is able to continue their work. So some say that if they don't have the exit way in their rug or that imperfection, then they won't continue their art form or their craft. I see this as uh, a Dene Navajo aesthetic, if you will, or, and in this case, I feel a type of Navajo or Diné poetics. This idea of energy transferring, much the same as one of my favorite pieces of writing uh, by Charles Olson called Projective Verse. And he also um, approaches this idea of energy energy transfer as well from the poet to the page and from the page to the listener or to the reader. Um, so in, in, in the now weaving, we have, we, we have the exact same, I guess you could say, um, concept, but in this case, it's a, it's a cultural concept that's ha has already been there, right? Embedded within Dene thought and Dene intellect and Dene uh, imagination, Dene poetics. So I'm going to um, share a poem from my second book uh, titled Letters, which is also published by Nightboat Books. Um, I read from Dura, which is also published by Nightboat wonderful press. Uh, I was very fortunate, I'm grateful to the press. Um, this year they had reprinted um, my second book of letters. So I'm really appreciative of that. Um, so I'm gonna read a longer poem from, from letters and then I'll end with um, a, newer, a newer piece. So the title of this poem is Nascent. It begins at a diacritical spark of breath and soma. Vowel stress, nasal enunciation, the tenors of existence. Ictis of Ina, inside where person, ticks in utero, 
like toi. Rippling skin. Hitherto by way of Sonus, in a moment, in accordance with vocabulary. Body forms. The single E long interval appends in muscular two of na. See the inks, flagella zigzag, skur towards page ovum to perforate its egg coat. Fecundate the nucleus of this sheet opposite of black light, static vibrating epidermis, eardrum. It's a plash on parchment sheet, a single drip seep, ink as semen, saturates fibrous layers, stimulates the origin of the length of a tongue, igniting between no light and caught tin rag paper the acute cadence, glisters, a glottal flicker, like dotting the top of an upper stem, head, less human silhouette, throat deep, where the parturition of phrase, of aphorism, breathes and coos, Ab owo, their sound only sound shaping, visible bod and noggin to hear perspicacity. It is active fro and to an infinite oscillation of analphabetic procreation to circumflex. D, these pitches of stress these flares over letters hover, keep in place the strained origin in speech. These newborn glissandos, these movements, tense and revise type size. Where deets up designs permanence. Pronunciation marks are proof. Of one's own cultural sentience. Those authentic reverberations. Above the cap height where breath. 
pressures tongue against teeth. Below the baseline where throat exhales the long accent vowel. In that moment, it echoes through nose, quivers as phonemic air. The ogonic tickle of clean Someone once said to debate, oneself is to debate the page. It's a space, a locus of excursus, where vibrations leap between self and proportion. When one peers into that leaf mirror of white and hush, it subsumes thought because the word I, a reflection of the mind is supple and limitless. To say it means to practice immediacy but to write it means to construct perpetuity. Because within the expanse of page, ego is proton, like shade produced by body. And in that movement, when one strokes that single vertical, descends the line, and stipples a dot. Its ink blood courses. A letter on the page affirms the being of person, per in accordance with the root sun a prod and slit like an iota contour. Written, a projection of what occurs instantly in the mind, our sense of self, air, vibration waves in air until we materialize body size between the X height. This is why we understand ourselves through the placement and movement of ink absorbing into paper. So I'm gonna share um, uh, my last poem for tonight it's um it's a draft um something new i suppose this is titled book fray in the book's binding a copyright of hurt moment when a page rips out by a hand resentful. Index finger and thumb both comply to a sound, irresolute. From a loose signature of a spine worn by usages 
when a palm presses intrusively into the notches from tail to head, unforgivable. It's stitch of thoughts where fingers callous with no regard to detail and thread unravels so easily. In the beginning, hands impatiently work dreadful memories of a dull needle, desperate to sew into a fragile fold. It punctures each sheet where once before a crease made carefully, now harm. With each sew, there's pain, lining with pulp as it slowly absorbs a repression. The string wears thin with each pull through stations not made for sensation, yet aggravation. Yeah, thank you so much for listening and being present with me tonight and, you know, for everyone being present tonight as well. Thank you. Thank you so much. So, Stephen, do you want to introduce the Q&A? I was going to ask you the same thing, but of course, okay. um, we have a tradition in POG of opening up the floor to anybody who's here who would like to ask a question or make a comment or anything to this beautiful, beautiful poems and to Orlando. And, yeah. Yeah. And, and I uh, sent something to ask people to unmute. So I think you can unmute yourself if you'd like to ask a question. There aren't so many of us. So I, I think, you know, you could um, probably just jump in. Would you put it back on the gallery screen? Okay. I am decimated. Uh -huh. Are there any Hello. questions? <laughs> what it what it took to do that? I have no words. Oh well, yeah. Thank you, Nicole. I appreciate that. <laughs> I just wanted to ask Orlando when you had the page up, the rug in a sense up. The rug, the paper. Um, it it felt like. It's also a body. You know, the, the page is a body, the rug is a body, and much of your work, the letter is a body. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and and that too needs places to exit, breath to exit, which connects that to me also to the Olson, how, you know, breath has something to do with defining the body of the poem. I don't know how to, I don't know about phrasing that as a question, but do you yeah. think of all those things as bodies, I guess? And in, in, in does that have reverberations for you? Yeah, I, 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 I grew up, um, my fam, I come from a family of weavers. So, you know, like my mom is a weaver. Most of my mom's sisters are weavers. So, you know, watching her, watching my mother weave rugs, of course, it wasn't later until I started writing poetry that I began to understand that, you know, the page is really this 
this energy that somehow becomes physical, right? Through, through the motion of the body. Um, if you ever, you know, like I, I used to watch my mom set up her loom, you know? And so there would be a loom and there, there would this be sort of this blank space in the middle in it. And the loom is sort of shaped for, at least for me, like like the outline of, of, of a sheet of paper. And with her body, she begins to set up her loom with all of these, you know, instruments and all of these materials. And, and even after she sets up her loom, you know, she'd sit there and begin to weave from, from the, from the bottom up. So uh, the nail weavers uh, weave um, upright. So, and typically start from the bottom by the time and work their way up through the loom. And by the time they get to the top, you know, this beautiful image appears. And so I sort of see the materials as, you know, the language I use, meaning the letters themselves, but even the 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 sounds of the letters as well are are the materials that help shape um, what I would think um, the pages as well, the punctuation. And it is, it, you know, um, basically my 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 mother is breathing life into this rug, right? Her, her body is also her body, which is also her heart and her mind, her imagination, her intelligence is sort of transferring into the rug. And through what we call chihunte, right? The exit way or the spirit line is a way for, you know, again, as I mentioned, the rug weaver to continue their process, right? To continue their craft, their art form. Um, it's also, it, it also addresses the notion of duality in our culture as well. Um, Chihwint is also an imperfection. Um, so most Navajo rugs, especially older ones, have an imperfection in it. Um, if you ever look at Navajo rugs, they're so symmetrically beautiful, right? So it almost sort of looks perfect. But the exit way or the spirit line balances that perfection. It creates an imperfection. Um, so there's this kind of philosophy into right the the art form of of rug weaving that because of this imperfection as an artist, right, that idea of sort of pursuing, I guess you could say perfection or whatever that means that you know um you know like along the way as artists obviously we we make mistakes we experiment right we we do all these sort of things until we reach um you know like some sort of vision in terms of what we see as original art i suppose but um but yeah i mean i definitely see the rug as a body um you know because like i mentioned through chihuahua to her the exit way the spirit line you know the the artist's energy from their body, which is, you know, their breath, right, transfers into in, into this rug. And as a result of the exit way or the spirit line, then the viewer and, you know, the person who who, who sort of experiences the the rug also feels that energy too and feels that that spirit of I guess you could say the rug weaver. So. Um, so you know, you know, I, I sort of see this as a as a as a Diné poetics, uh, a Navajo poetics. I know that I, you know, when I was an undergrad, I I learned I, I read projective verse, and I think the reason why I gravitated towards projective verse was because what he was saying sounded so familiar to me, and you know, and and how it sounded familiar, it you know, I, I grew up with that, right? I. I I grew up around my mom weaving and, you know, around that idea of, um, 
some of the things that Olson approaches in terms of, you know, breath, you know. Um, I've always I've always liked the idea that like, you know, that the origin of the line in poetry is is breath, right? To me, that's a very Olson projective verse, right? Composition by field sort of um, idea. So um, I, I don't know if that answers your question, Charles, but yeah, I mean, yeah. I do see, I, I do see the rug as, as a body as well. Oh, just the same way I see like the lowercase letter I as yes. a body as well, right? <laughs> but also I see the page as a body too. Um, Mm -hmm. I, I have a question. Yes. Um, Orlando, I really enjoyed your reading. I thought it was really moving. Thank you. Um, I'm curious about, I noticed that your, um, you read the poems at a much slower pace than you speak. Um, and I'm curious if you uh, have ideas about time and uh, silence mm -hmm. and how those are informing the poems nice good question mm -hmm. yeah i i think for me it, it again comes back to composition by field by olsen as well um but also thinking about in my own language you know um we do have an alphabet but it's it's um it's based off the Roman text primarily, so we don't actually have a syllabary. But um, we have all the letters of the English alphabet except for um, U, the letter U. We don't have any U sounds. But there's one particular sound in our language that that is an actual letter and that is an actual sound, and in English it is known as an apostrophe. And so in our language, when you write it down, when you use the apostrophe, it's an actual letter and sound, and it's referred to as a glottal, a glottal stop, right? Where it creates this pause. And, you know, also me growing up with and hearing the Dene language, the Navajo language, it's it's a phrasal language, but between these phrases, there are also these glottal stops that appear, which I find very interesting. That that sort of silence that emphasizes sound more. So you know, diacritical marks in terms of linguistics are you know like um, I I always sort of see tr true sound on the page. Um, in the form of diacritical marks, right? There's the letters, of course, there's the, the the sort of physical body and the physical aspect of the letter, but it's true sound. I always sort of find that it comes from diacritical marks. So, so the apostrophe in our language creates the silence um, and that creates a kind of signature for me, a kind of, um, um, signature in terms of rhythm, right, on the page, much like how, you know, maybe one would use a comma or a semicolon, right, creating sort of that pause. Um, I love, I love the Sejora. I think the Sejora is just a really beautiful looking word too. It's just, I like the way it's spelled. I, I love the way it sounds. <laughs> Um, but also its meaning is very deep for me. Um, I always remember when I was an undergraduate, the poet Arthur Z, uh, the Chinese American poet Arthur Z, he was he was my professor when I was an undergrad, and I used to remember he said he he said something like respect the Sejora. Right? Um and that sort of left an impression on me because I, I love how um silence informs my my process and i i i i do my best to uh choreograph that on the page so meaning you know i use a lot of space on the page between phrases lines words etc um 
so I also see I also see the page as a kind of composition, right? In terms of music, as Olson would also talk about too, is um, you know creating this kind of rhythm on the page. And also, I I also just really quickly want to explain too, um, where where I'm originally from is a place called Tohlakan. Um It's it's Sweetwater in general, but um. Where I'm from is very, very, very quiet. So you have this sort of flat desert landscape, high desert landscape where I'm from. Like there's no, there's no trees. You know, it's just mostly red dirt. Um, so it looks like, you know, uh, like where Luke Skywalker's from, from Star Wars, right? From the desert planet. Um, it's the quietest place I've ever grown up in. I've brought friends there and who who are not from like this area and the quiet really bothers them. Like it, it's it becomes very frustrating for them. But when I'm there, it it's it's a it's a part of who I am. And what I mean by that is as a Dene, as a Navajo person, my when I was, you know, like when I was um you know, they say that when you're born, uh, when your umbilical cord is cut, they bury it in the place that you're from originally. So for me, originally, I'm from Tothakan, this place that is this vast, high desert, right? Um, and it's the quietest place I, I know. Um, I've never been anywhere else as quiet as 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 Tothakan. And um I remember like I've had friends who have come and visited out there and um you know they'll be like, oh yeah, like okay, I get it now, you know. Um that silence from that environment from which I grew up in, that complete quiet that is sort of beautiful and deep informs my process as a poet too as a poetry writer like the silence from the land itself right that quiet from um from which i grew up in in, in, in the environment of, of tofakan of sweet water so you know that that also really informs um the way i read as well you know and I love uh, the the notion of meditation too, and how that works into. Um, I, I you know I I use space a lot of space on the page to sort of obviously emphasize images, right? Images in my in my work, uh, imperatives in my work, um, sounds in my work, specific words or phrases in my work. So yeah. I hope that answers your question, Trace. Is it Tracy? Or yeah, Tracy? That either one Tracy. is good. Tracy. Yeah. Um. Thank you, Orlando. That's that's beautiful. It's really fascinating to hear about. Um. Can, can I ask something kind of related that also goes back to sort of what Charles was talking about, but from the other side? I don't know if this will make sense, but um, you know, you talked about uh, projective verse, right? And there. You know, Olson talks about the typewriter, but he's not interested really in a kind of spatial graphics, but just as the typewriter is allowing a score for oral performance. And Steve McCaffrey and his stuff on Maximus says that's all very well and good, but it won't explain what's going on in the page in Maximus. You know, it's not the page in Maximus is not just a score for oral performance. It's a different kind of space. And that gets at, for me, you know, what I take to be something of a, a kind of good you know, back and forth or tension between the oral and the the concrete or the visual or the written in your work. And um, if I were thinking about weaving, which I know nothing about, um, I guess what I might want to say uh, to ask is, isn't there a way in which the kind of individual expressionist bodily energy goes into a space or a field that isn't identical to the body and, you know, sort of it's, it's, it's a different sort of structure or a different space. And what you were saying about the silence of the place where you grew up, you know, seems similar to me that, 
you know, there's voicing and there's this other field that one enters that isn't exactly the same as the oral or articulation. Yeah, thank you for that, Tenny. Um, yeah, you know, you know, I mean, you know, thinking of of of, of the sort of, I guess you could say the um, the aesthetics of of oral tradition. I think, it, for, like you know, from a Diné perspective, the oral tradition creates these kinds of images like these you know the this sort of um, um flow of, of images and imagery which you know really um are are i guess you could say vibrations from 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 the land itself i you know i i know it sounds kind of weird but like um and and then those vibrations are i mean you know i mean we can write now in in navajo but it's 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 through the lens of 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 you know the uh, Greek and Roman um, font, the the English font. Um, so yeah, I mean it, it's interesting. Um, <clears throat> you know, thinking about all of the, uh, the the relationship between, at least for me, uh, uh, as a poet, and my relationship to the page. Um, it's very, uh, yeah, I, yeah, again, I, I feel like a lot of, a lot of what informs my process and my work really comes from where I am and where I'm originally from. So, but also not to say that English is, is not beautiful. I mean, the English language is a very beautiful language, I think, you know, um, it's so malle malleable that you could, you could do so much with it, you know? In Navajo, you can't really do that, you know. So, but in my concrete poems, I'm I'm trying to, you know, uh, explore that sort of break out of that that the Navajo language can be uh, also expressed in this certain kind of way, you know, at least with the you know the concrete sort of visual poems that I'm working with in terms of my language. So, anyway, I'm sort of ranting now. I'm sorry. But, um, thank you, Tony. I was just going to say that even, I mean, people see silence as quiet, but I think your silence is very loud because you make those pauses. Um, the pauses end up taking more space than the language. And and in, in performance in general, silence is incredibly loud. So I, I don't know, I just, just thinking about that because then people become much more aware of themselves in those silences, you know? <laughs> yeah, it makes me think of, um, maybe was it, was it John Cage? Oh yeah, yeah. Performance where it was just like, it was just silence basically <laughs> for like for a really long time mm -hmm. um i like his lecture on nothing um mm -hmm. i don't know if any of you have ever read that piece by um by cage but um it's a really beautiful piece titled lecture on nothing in which these sort of spaces create this kind of rhythm at least for me that create this kind of um energy if you will that I feel like really like the way the, even just the way it's written it sort of really pays respects to to silence and the way it should appear on the page. So, um, but yeah, thank you for that comment, Raviko. Because I, mean, I mean, I think that's the other thing is when you know if anyone has ever meditated, and you know it's like this whole idea of like oh it's you know so gentle and beautiful and it's like the, the most suffering place to be because you're uh, you're so engrossed within your own silence and within the silence of the space and and then the loudness of your mind you know and uh and so I don't know I was just thinking about that when people brought that up mm -hmm. 
We've gone uh, a little more beyond what we usually do in these Q&As, but uh, if there's one more question, we'll, we'll take it or one more comment. Okay. I, I, I just wanted to uh, mention the, the last piece that you read, the work in progress, because it brought something up that maybe we hadn't seen before, at least in what you read earlier, which is the book, which is a whole new, you know, heavily weighted, heavily meaningful objects. And I, I'm wondering if, if you're seeing some sort of continuity or relationship between letter and line and page and rug or that, that sort of two-dimensional field. The book now, you also use the word fold, which is really interesting because when you have the geometry of the book, the page itself gets folded and it, it creates a, you know, an entirely new kind of set of spaces. And you also use that beautiful imagery of, of, of the thread and needle, which makes us aware that the, the page has a front and a back. There's two sides of the space and there's an invisibility. There's parts of the space that we don't see, but that we can access through these punctures, through these weavings. Uh, it, it just really was beautiful the way all the, everything else came together. And that, that's a new work which I'm just curious whether that maybe that's something that the book becomes this gathering point, the way the letter you know, has been. Yeah, you know, I, I think with that new, with that new, the new poem that I had just, I actually have never read it in, in public before so this time tonight. So, um, yeah, you know, um, I've, I've been really interested in the idea of, uh, you know, the, um, I think I think for me the the idea of how the you know the a book gets um, made right and then after it's made it's sort of abused right I mean it's read I mean it's it's full of all of this wonderful stuff and um, I sort of have a kind of a like like an image in the poem where like the palm is sort of kind of pressing against the spine, right? You know, like when you're reading a book, you open it and then you press it to keep it open, right? And for some reason, like for me in my head, I I I, I sort of wonder how the book feels, like <laughs> you know, there's perhaps there, there there's this kind of pain that from from the physicality of that that occurs sort of just imagining that um you know that uh that kind of um experience if you will um but yeah you know i mean i'm definitely very interested now and and you know it's it's also sort of tied i mean i'm also very influenced by um edmund jabez and my favorite and his, yeah. yeah and and you know um you know like his book of questions were were really, really be like just for me, very seminal and and also sort of shaping the way I think about things as well as a writer. So, um, so yeah, you know, I mean, I think uh, a lot of my poems, I think, are sort of kind of a little bit objective, but I think with this newer piece, I feel it's a little bit more like I don't know, I guess maybe a little bit more emotional or um you know, a little bit more. So yeah, I'm, I'm trying to explore some things, but I'm also doing the concrete visual stuff too. So um, yeah. Well, thank you for that, Stephen. Thank you. I mean, my goodness, mm -hmm. you know. Yeah, that's beautiful. I want to say we're very connected to that kind of thing too, the mound work. So it's you know, nice to see that. Well, uh, I want to say thank you. I want to say let's do it again uh, with Myung and when that mm -hmm. becomes possible and uh it's beautiful thank you charles um yeah thank you everybody for tuning in and listening i really appreciate it so thanks Rohan. thank you everybody and happy holidays and happy new year and i hope that we see you all next year on and on. Good night. Thank, thank you, you.